to another edition of Thunderdome! Welcome to the Mad Max Minute, where we take problems head on in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 97, which begins with Max positioning himself in front of the air truck, and it ends with Max lying in the dirt. Joining us this week is friend of the show, Brad Mull from the Lost World Minute. Hey Brad, how's it going? Hello guys, it has been a while. (laughs) It has been, I would estimate, about 14 months <laughs> since we last had you at a guest on the show. That's all right. I've, I've still been fairly active in the uh, group, though, so I didn't disappear completely. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when we have you on for the very beginning of Road Warrior and here at the climax of Thunderdome. Mm, yeah, it was one of those things where you jump straight on in the first five minutes of uh, Road Warrior and then... As it was going along, I'm thinking, hey, I've, I've blown my one chance of being on the show here in the first <laughs> the first five minutes. <laughs> but no, here we're here. We're back with a different film and uh, second time's a charm. Yeah. Now, last time we were talking and you mentioned that you were going to be taking a trip in the first quarter of 2018. How did that go? That was absolutely fantastic. It was good in planning that trip out to Silverton to where some of the, uh, or where most of Road Warrior was filmed talking to a couple of locals before I went and get some information because I had planned on going out to the creek where the gyrocraptor, uh, gyrocraptor, the gyrocopter was uh, filmed out there, but all that's on private property now and um, even the pinnacles themselves, private property. But being able to get out there and um, catch up with Adrian at the Mad Max Museum, he's still got a lot of contacts out there with access to these locations and the first night camped up on top of the lookout Monday Monday lookout and um, got to see that beautiful sunrise and sunset up there and the second night actually camped down where the ex- uh, interceptor exploded <laughs> in that little ravine so nice it was just great being up there and seeing the locations what they would have had to deal with up there yes it wasn't exactly winter but um, it was still getting pretty cold at night and um, just the other things like just how windy it is up on that lookout on those hills. So much so the local government sold off some of the area to the local power company and they've just put big wind turbines up there and absolutely ruined the uh, majesticness of the, the area. But um, yeah, and you definitely see that in Road Warrior. Like a lot of times when they're filming up there, you can see it's constantly blowing. There's dust blowing across the road and it's not practical effects they're actually doing for the film. It's real wind blowing. You see it when Max gets the truck started. You see it when the end, when you get that pull back and the fade out of him standing there and actually burnt tires to get that effect of just the, the black smoke <laughs> billowing across the road. So it was definitely an experience and it was great to go out there and see some of the locations and experience it. Yeah, I bet. I remember when you posted some of those pictures when you'd gotten home and they looked great. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab a couple and um, repost up when this minute goes up just as a refresh because, um, yeah, that would be a few months ago now that they'd be um, disappeared down the feed but yeah <laughs> it's just especially with a lot of films now where most of it's on stage sound stages green screen everything else it's just great to be able to visit an actual location just seeing how narrow the road actually is out there and realizing well they would have drove this big rig down there of cars swarming all around it and also just some of the ways the film was cut that final chase scene for example where they used three separate locations and cut it all together like it was one the one long chase so yeah (laughs) and it was good to go fosking for some artifacts too Mm -hmm. left over from the film (laughs) did you have a metal detector out on the side of the road trying to find little scraps i didn't i spent about an hour and a half walking up and down the road where humongous's vehicle exploded and i actually found a piece of a magneto off a starter motor so whether that's off that that vehicle or not but but just there was that and there was a little sardine tin in that creek bed where the explorer went up when they were setting up they were sitting there having their food there's a couple of photos of them eating um from tin food the uh, stunt guys when they'd done the um the cannonball stunt in that in that same location so it might not be it might have been just someone throwing rubbish out the window but it's it's in my little keepsake drawer on my display <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> as i mentioned here at the top We are here in minute 97. We're starting with Max more or less driving alongside the plane, and he's pulling ahead to position himself between the air truck and the, I keep calling it the vehicle fleet that Auntie is commanding. I love the visuals of the opening moments of this minute. It feels 
very much classic Mad Max. Mm-hmm. Yes, well, I don't know if you covered it in the last minute, but he's but he's here back in a vehicle again. For the whole film, he hasn't really been in that driver's seat as we know him, and now he's back. He's taking control here. We get the ADR or the, the sound of the truck accelerating past the aeroplane here, and just... It's obviously some sort of overpowered NASCAR or something. Just the way it roars and, <laughs> and, and shoots forward, but it just it makes the hair rise on my on my arms every time when it happens. It's one of my favorite shots of the film. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because I just realized he's a cop and a driver, and this is the first time we've really seen him commandeering his own vehicle. Like, yeah, he was driving the cowhide car. Oh yes, he stole it from that cowboy hat guy but that wasn't his car this camel cart or whatever we're calling it is max's own vehicle it's his replacement interceptor i guess i mean nothing can truly replace the interceptor but no he's back behind the wheel of his own car doing his thing and it's in that 15 years it's possible too that he's never actually driven it before (laughs) we don't know how much fuel if he had any fuel on board when it was getting towed across the desert by those camels if he had sort of a reserve in there in case something happened or if it was just something he's been putting together over time and it's never driven but obviously blackfinger was able to get it going pretty easily so using that magical methane that they make (laughs) and it's quite possible that max never expected to be able to drive that truck again Hmm. whether he ever got to or not he probably had experienced the absolute and complete drought of fuel and thought, okay, the days of actually driving this truck are over and it's camels from here on out. So this might be a bit of a treat for him. Mm. One important detail that we definitely skipped last Friday, as Max pulls in front of the air truck, I don't see a guard hanging out the passenger side of that vehicle. So I think what he did is he grabbed the guard that was unconscious, the one that Screw Loose just battered into oblivion. He probably was already dead when they got to that point, but he probably pulled that guard out of the car in the off chance that he was still alive. It does seem the prudent thing to do. <laughs> We're going to get that in in a couple of minutes' time where uh, that guard returns. <laughs> so... But yeah, you would, especially in a couple of shots here where you can completely see through the uh, the inside of the car and you can see it's clearly only Max inside. Plus, it just makes sense. If you've got someone lying in the passenger seat, you don't want them suddenly waking up and making trouble, so to speak. It'd add more tension to the scene if he had to then have to struggle with this guard that had woken up, having his focus on that guard and the oncoming iron bar as well but sort of it it does a lot of times in movies they just sort of add that extra level of um the hero has another issue he has to overcome before he can win the day they didn't go that way here (laughs) they've already got the stress of the situation of max climbing out of the vehicle and trying to get to a position where he can leap off of it having a hand reach up from inside the vehicle and grab his ankle for him to kick off oh i don't know if i could have handled that That would seem more akin to the ending of Road Warrior, where the rig chase, there were continuously like one thing after another, you know, reaching out of thin air to grab Mac to try and stop him from his goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So having that one last obstacle that he has to overcome, even if it's momentary, would fall in line more with Road Warrior. Speaking of Road Warrior, this whole end sequence here specifically, feels very reminiscent of Road Warrior in that Max is in a truck barreling straight ahead at an adversary who is in another vehicle and they are going to collide head on with each other. Mm. Although this time, and a couple of guests have brought up in past minutes, that uh, there's that thought that maybe Humongous was actually willingly going head on with that truck Mm. and not just surprised that it come over the ridge all of a sudden. Whereas here... Um, you clearly see Iron Bar smiles and his uh, vehicle uh, lurch- lurches forward and uh, sort of accepts the head-on challenge, which isn't really going to clear the road for the aeroplane, but <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Iron Bar, his whole attitude, I have to admire it. He's really quite resilient and has had his life threatened and nearly taken several times already. And he is racing forward I believe he has raced ahead of most of the other vehicles. Oh, yeah. And he just ends up in a head-on that, once again, should kill him. We'll find out whether or not it does. But he's grinning and growling the whole way, just ready to take it on. And you've you've been bringing it up since uh, since he launched those arrow bolts at 
Blaster, just how from that point he's sort of been going off and doing his own thing without necessarily having the approval of Auntie. Um, and here it seems the same thing, where he's, there's been well no communications that we can see. He's just right, I'm going to get out and take on this vehicle and do it on my own. Absolutely. I suppose from Auntie's point of view, he has gone completely rogue and is now an uncontrolled agent. I wouldn't say he's completely uncontrolled. I'd say that he's more of a dog off a leash. Hmm. When they picked him up in that gully somehow after he fell off the train, <laughs> somehow <laughs> they should have realized that if they gave him his own vehicle that he would do something like this. Very true. Just his actions of going after that train truck on a hand trolley <laughs> or a hand crank is just enough to know that he's lost the plot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It'd be like Wes just starting to run after the, the truck, the tanker or something <laughs> in Road Warrior, just completely lost the plot and trying to run down the vehicle on foot. Comparing Iron Bar to Wes for a moment, Wes was also a dog off his leash. Literally. Literally. Mm. But he was a little bit smarter about it. He never resorted to grabbing the proverbial hand truck and just running after Max. Even to his own detriment and taking huge risks, stealing Humongous's truck. I think he was more productive about how he went about going off his leash. Maybe a little bit more, I don't know, thoughtful or strategic about it. Mm. Whereas Iron Bar just... Seems to do the first thing that comes to mind. He seems to be a bit more impulsive. Yeah, and Wes was sort of more driven by anger over the uh, death of his <laughs> young boy there, where here it's sort of, it's just, it's all been because of Max showing up Iron Bar, or sort of just, yeah, showing him up constantly. <laughs> Yeah, it could be argued that Wes's desire for revenge was a li- was not a little bit, it was more justified. Whereas Iron Bar, it seems to be a bit of perhaps professional jealousy. Well, he kept getting shown up by Max in Underworld. Although, when you think about it, what did Max really do to Iron Bar? He didn't drop the feed chute on his head. He didn't swing into him and kick him into the feces vat. Well, it started back in the penthouse. Well, Max threw him off the penthouse yes. that one time. Although Iron Bar really didn't seem to mind that too much. He no. was pretty quiet in that part of the movie, but he didn't seem to hold it against Max. I think he really started to dislike Max once Max refused to kill Blaster. And it could also be just through association. Like Wes in Road Warrior, like you, you can run but you can't hide. Seeing Max as part of the compound now. Yeah. And here, wherever trouble appears, Max is there. Because I'm pretty sure they see each other during that action scene or that segment where uh, they steal the truck and get out of the underworld. Yeah, Iron Bar actually comes pretty close to uh, giving Max the business end of a shovel, Mm. but he showboats too much, (laughs) and it gives Savannah and Screwloose too much of an opening. And I think Iron Bar accelerating ahead of the rest of the fleet here in his vehicle, singling out Max, catching sight of him and grinning, is an extension of... I'm about to take these guys out. Oh, look, it's the guy that kicked me in the face and made me fall off of that bridge, more or less. He's definitely on a revenge kick, in my personal opinion. I think he holds Max responsible for the whole ordeal. And from Meyer Bar's point of view, it's really hard to tell what on earth happened here. Yeah. It's- the long and the short of it is that Max was gulagged and he came back. And you're not supposed to come back. No. No. <laughs> And Iron Bar was the one who officially sent him off on the gulag. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That'd be a pretty big blow to your ego right there. Someone that you gulag ends up showing their face again, thereby invalidating your gulagging of them. <laughs> You have now been branded an ineffective gulager. That'd make quite a brand on his chest. <laughs> They'd have to do two lines. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Keep the margins. <laughs> and it's, it's one of those classic tropes of the hero being banished or sent away only to return as well but it's definitely if you're if you're sending someone away and all of a sudden they come back it's it's not something you want to you want to deal with straight away certainly not speaking of this idea of returning we get this really good shot coming up behind the plane looking forward and you see max ahead 
kicking up dust. And then in the very far distance, you can see the line of cars. And I like this angle because it explains why they had to turn around 180 degrees and go back the way they went. Because you can really see how smooth that runway is compared to the more rough looking terrain on either side. So instead of them going off at a 45 degree angle away from the horde, they wouldn't be able to take off because the ground would just be too rough. They've got to go straight here. Yeah. Last minute, did you bring up the possibility of going over that cliff and gliding up to takeoff speed? We did, yes. <laughs> okay, all right. We won't, <laughs> we won't redirect and yeah. get back over it. But it, yeah. uh, it didn't go well for us. That idea got shot down pretty far because if you're not going fast enough to generate any sort of lift, you're going to go off that cliff and yeah i guess if you nose down you could try and build up speed that way but they don't know how high that cliff is hmm. and if they can't generate enough speed by the time they reach the bottom of that cliff well they're not going to get a chance to take off again yeah and then this sort of goes all the way back to those earlier minutes where um jebediah and that sort of come in and knocked max off his car to start with the one thing i couldn't find when researching this plane was it's takeoff speed mm -hmm. but stall speed of 48 miles an hour roughly so that's sort of how even at a glide how fast you would have been going to hit max and it was brought up during that minute sort of how hard that impact would have been and how fast the plane would have been going but even just sailing off that cliff or even here sort of trying to get up to speed to take off like the plane itself the cruise speed's about 117 miles an hour so normally most planes do about a third of that in takeoff or half it in takeoff so it's interesting that max is ahead in his car and has to go faster than the plane to get ahead and cause the damage before the plane can then sort of take off and overtake him <laughs> yeah and he's putting down the pedal pretty hard on that car because even in that overhead shot where we're making our way over the plane max is pulling ahead mm. it's going to look like they're a lot closer in later shots of this minute. But for the most part, I think he's going to have a pretty good lead on the plane clearing the way. And it's just a plus to the practical and just being able to feel and see that speed. Yes, some shots you got the camera down low to the ground just to make it seem a lot fast. But where here you've got the camera a little bit higher and I'm guessing a helicopter shot following the, uh, the plane and truck. It just shows that feel of speed and how fast the two groups are going to come together in a minute. Now, we almost started talking about the plane last week. We've had so many instances to talk about it, but you actually looked up quite a bit about it. Have you practiced the pronunciation of the name? <laughs> uh, it was nicknamed the air truck. Yeah. I'll, I'll call it the air truck. Transavia. No, I still can't do it. Because um, <laughs> I've been calling it the Transavia. That'll do. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> but Transavia, that almost sounds like it was made in somewhere in Eastern Europe. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a New Zealand design, so it sort of it adds those things. But it, it being built from 1966 to 1993, so it's definitely being released in the time when this film would be set, all the 15 years before the uh, bombs fell. It has a lifting capacity of a, pretty much a ton, metric ton, which, did we have a count of how many kids were in the back of it? I think there's about eight mm -hmm. plus master. That's not a ton no, <laughs> of not. weight. Even with, well, they cut all his uh, extra stuff free that was hanging on the wings and that, but... Yeah, so it can carry 2,000 pounds on takeoff, which is something it's not doing here. But uh, only 118 of them were made. And as of 2008, only three remain airborne. And surprisingly, after reading that, there's one here that uh, still spreads fertilizer on farms. Really? Yeah, I used to see it fly overhead quite often when I was on the farm here. Which, <laughs> just another one of those little things, there's only three of them in service or as of 2008. I haven't been on the farm since about 2012, so I haven't had the chance to see if it's still in operation. I suppose a bit of a Google search locally in the Yellow Pages might, might have brought that up, but yeah, and I just found it funny when you Google the actual aircraft, the first image that comes up on the Google search is a bit sort of turning around the cliffs as um, Max's car arrives on scene in the last minute, or the minute before. It's just another instance in these films where they sort of go for those um, lesser-known vehicles. You've got the, uh, the old Mack truck from earlier mm -hmm. that has a few panels and that missing but it's still clearly one of those 50s models trucks and i guess that's production too just being able to find something cheap to use on set needing to buy an airplane to fly around in filming and then do all the miniature work later on the film as well we've established that max is ahead of the plane he's accelerating iron bar is accelerating towards him and in all of the instances that we've seen in these movies of Max driving headlong towards someone, he's never done what we're about to see him do. Right about 
halfway through this minute, Max climbs out the side of his car and prepares to bail. It's gotta be that Max realizes that he's not in a gigantic Mack truck. He remembers what happened 15 years ago during Road Warrior. He doesn't want to be in that situation again. And so he's got this new plan of climbing out the side of the truck, climbing up to what I can only assume is where he would sit when he would drive the camels, and then leaping from there. It's possible, too, that he can see while the last two films he's come across this uh, head-to-head sequence or issue before where he's been in the bigger vehicle except for the first movie where sort of Knight Rider and uh, the Interceptor are sort of around the same size vehicles, but... uh, it might be just the fact here that you can see the vehicle coming is a lot larger and it's just, there's no way <laughs> I'm even going to try. But it's sort of, it does take away from those earlier earlier head-on-head or head-on um, challenges where yeah. in the first movie he was sort of on that white line on the on the edge and was probably prepared to go out in a head-on with Knight Rider. <laughs> Do you think now that he's older, a little bit more road-weary, that he may have lost some of that hard edge? I just wonder what he's thinking when he's going to hit the hit the ground at 50-odd miles an hour and tumble. <laughs> it does seem like a huge risk jumping from this truck, which, of course, is still less of a risk than going ahead and hitting Iron Bar yeah. still in the vehicle. So I guess it's the lesser of two evils. But at the same time, that's a huge risk. And I've wondered before, a few minutes ago, back when Iron Bar was dangling from the truck train, <laughs> Well, why doesn't he just let go and hit the ground and roll? Like, well, that doesn't seem really like a viable option. He would be too injured. Mm -hmm. Well, Max does it and he's fine. I was perplexed by this whole thing because Max more or less swan dives off the front of the (laughs) truck and he tucks his head in at the last minute. He makes sure that his shoulder is the first thing to hit the ground. And then he doesn't so much roll as much as fall into a soft patch of dirt and stay there. And this whole idea of jumping out of a vehicle, it perplexed me. So I went on Google and I started searching around and I found a how-to article from the art of manliness.com. Of course. <laughs> Jeez. And of course, a lot of what they say in that article is don't jump out of vehicles. If you've got a perfectly fine vehicle and you don't need to jump out of it, don't. And they said, however, if you absolutely need to, you know, there are steps that you can take. Obviously, you want to open up your door as wide as you can so you can have a clear jumping avenue. You want to jump away from your vehicle instead of in front of your vehicle because you don't want to get run over. (laughs) You want to tuck and roll to therefore reduce the amount of impact on your joints. And the last step they had for jumping out of a vehicle was... Stay still because you've probably broken something and if you can, <laughs> call an ambulance. <laughs> At least here he has the benefit of not having a door, but even there's, there's so many when tricks or stunts go wrong videos everywhere of just people stepping out of their car or something just to be funny and either going under the back wheel or the door getting stuck in the door because the car's then gone backwards or (laughs) stupid things like that. But at least here he doesn't have the door so he can sort of jump out. But he's also forgetting that there's a plane barreling down behind him as well. And they can't really steer that well when they're on the ground, especially in takeoff. (laughs) He was directly in front of it. But then all of a sudden here, yeah, as he hits the ground, he's lost all that speed and just sort of rolls over into a pile of dirt. (laughs) I think Max has a lot of good luck in this movie when it comes to falling off of vehicles onto the one very soft pile of dirt that happens to be in the area. (laughs) We saw it happen in those first couple of minutes. We're seeing it happen here again. Yeah. And Julia, you brought up before with Iron Bar on the front of the the cow catcher on that truck and not just jumping off. Well, we've seen him also fall from that steam pipe when it was cut off and that, that creek under that bridge wouldn't have had any water in it. So he was landing again at speed on the dirt. So it's not the first time someone's landed softly on the ground and survived. Yeah. What was my hypothesis? I was hoping that he landed in a very soft bush or something like that. Yeah. Not that arid environments are known for their soft foliage, but it's a nice idea that maybe he fell into a large bush or small tree or something like that. It's possible. <laughs> Even though this is a different location, out there at Monday Monday Range and a lot of the around Silverton, the foliage is there because it can't be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> the spikes, <laughs> the spikes on a lot of the bushes and that, you brush up a gate and they just cut you. It's not something I'd want to land in. And yes, this is a different location and it's probably a little bit 
soft out there, but uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things where visiting a location, you don't get that feel or don't get that um, on film. Oh, well, if there's one thing that would make Iron Bar even more angry than being dropped off of a bridge, it would be landing in a thorny bush. <laughs> and it'd be comedic. It'd be like landing on a cactus. He'd come out and pull a, a, a fawn from his nose and it'd go twang or something as he'd done it. <laughs> well, now I'm really glad that we don't see that because Oof. we get enough Looney Tunes stuff in this movie already. Yeah. What with the actual Looney Tune showing up in the crack in the earth. <laughs> <laughs> really, what I take away from Max's jump from the truck is that he is prepared to give his life for that plane full of people. He took enormous risks. If he wasn't going to hit Iron Bar head on to cause the crash, jumping was an enormous risk. He could have been run over by... Any of the other vehicles not far behind Iron Bar, he could have been run over by the plane. He could have gotten caught on his own vehicle. I think he really was genuinely ready to die to help save them. You know, I don't think I've ever considered that before. The mindset that Max is in, because I see him jumping off the side of that vehicle as him taking a risk, but not wanting to fully sacrifice himself. I actually got the opposite feeling from watching the same clip that this was purely his self preservation instinct kicking in yes i'm gonna do this for these people but if i cannot drive headlong into a maniac then i'm not going to drive headlong into any maniacs anytime soon mm. well max is smart enough to know that the alternative is hardly any safer it is for max because this is max and he's incredibly lucky mm. but in the real world if this were to happen in the real world max would have been severely injured or died anyways yeah although i think real world reactions went out the window when iron bar survived that explosion <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, really did. <laughs> yep. Yeah, four loaded gas tanks there either side of him. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and all he was was just a little soot covered. That just, that's a little too much. Yeah. Did anybody notice when Iron Bar broke his tooth? Because in the truck, when we get the nice close up of him, he's got a broken tooth. Hmm. And I know it's new, but I can't put my finger on when it got there. Is it new? I've never taken a close look at Iron Bar's mouth before. Oh, no. <laughs> well, now I don't know. I'm questioning everything. Back to the penthouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might have to do some research on that and get back to it. I find it interesting that George Miller had Max jump off to the left of the vehicle because the easiest thing for Max to do would be to jump from the right of the vehicle. But as we know, Miller is all about visual shorthand. This whole time that we've been dealing with the Horde, they've been driving from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. And since the plane turned around, they've been driving from right to left. So in order to show Max jumping out the right side of the vehicle, they would have had to show Max from that side, and it would have been him driving from the left to the right, which is the bad guy direction. And for the sake of consistency, they would have to shoot it from that left side, meaning climbing out and then up and then jumping off. Well, I guess that's the reason then that he climbs up to the secondary driver's seat rather than just jumping from the door mm -hmm. because he needs to jump out the opposite side. He must have set up the accelerator and the steering wheel to keep going because it would have taken him a number of seconds to climb out the door up to the top and then jump. And all that time, if he hadn't set something up inside, the vehicle would be slowing down and honestly, probably pulling to one side or the other. <laughs> yeah, especially... With well, this vehicle, like sort of got those construction vehicle or bobcat tires on it, rolling resistance and all that on sand or dirt, <laughs> it would decrease speed a lot pretty quickly. And given that it's an old F truck, it, uh, it probably wouldn't drive in a straight line <laughs> before it was modified anyway. So Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if Max has some sort of steering lock that he can put on there. Because as the truck is getting pulled around by camels, either those wheels are locked in a forward-facing direction, which would make turning very difficult, or Max has some sort of lever that goes up to his camel driving seat that he can pull that lever left and right in oh. order to turn the wheels alongside whichever direction the camels are pulling him in. So perhaps he's taken that steering wheel and added a lot of resistance to it related to this secondary control mechanism that I've invented in my head. 
Hmm. So that would handle the direction, and then he's probably just got a redneck cruise control, aka a cinder block, <laughs> holding that <laughs> acceleration pedal down. The vehicle itself would still have its steering lock. If it's got an ignition, you should still be able to turn it off and lock the steering wheel. Hmm in place but um you can or well, getting that to keep the wheels true facing the right way um would be hard without it slowly veering one way or the other but- and maybe if a secondary steering mechanism did exist him climbing up to that secondary seat he'd still be able to direct the car right up to the last moment hmm. yeah he might have had to correct it from any drift between the time he left the steering wheel and made it up to the top so he corrects that and then waits for his moment to jump. I like the idea of a secondary steering mechanism up top, because, yeah, the whole thing with the camels, you need to be able to fix that. There's also his mastering of physics here, where he can actually time all this while iron bars bearing down at a speed he's not sure of. Right. <laughs> and get clear, <laughs> get clear before the collision happens. Oh. I am willing to bet that Max has a really good sense of distance and speed because, as we mentioned earlier, he's been doing these chicken races ever since way before the bombs fell. It happened with the Knight Rider. It happened with... Did he ever race chicken against Toe Cutter? Uh, Not against him. Kind of more with him. Mm, Yeah. uh, Against the the big rig that that smushed Toe Cutter. Yeah. Right. It was the other members of the gang that he played chicken with, and then they lost by going off the bridge and crashing yes. and all of that. So when people are labeled good drivers or like excellent drivers, I often wonder, well, what exactly, like what skills exactly are they referring to? And I think with Max, one of those specific skills that makes him a good driver is his ability to judge distance and speed and to use that information to his own advantage. I think there's a slight um, percentage of either craziness or sort of letting it all out on the line as well. Because we see, especially in the original film, he commits to the head-on and doesn't deviate at all. It's the other people that sort of chicken out and pull away at the last minute. Or in the bike's case, they just seem to (laughs) spread... fan out and go off the bridge but at least in road warrior he had the the element of i'm bigger than you i've got (laughs) more speed and mass than you (laughs) the incredible size of the mac and the incredible weight of the tanker filled with sand Mm. and again just being that location the incline on that hill and just how fast how much of a force that truck would have been when it hit that that even the prop um there's a reason it it goes in all directions (laughs) Speaking of incline, (laughs) as Max's vehicle collides with Iron Bar's vehicle, there seems to be a bump in the road that launches (laughs) Max's vehicle up into the front of Iron Bar's vehicle, tearing the front half of Iron Bar's vehicle clean from the back. There is almost a sheer bifurcation happening here as Max's truck flies up into the air and just takes Iron Bar with it. You know, my first inclination is to say that that was a weak spot, that they intended that vehicle to break in half. But from what I know of George Miller and his way with special effects, it's not really his way. He would kind of rather let it happen a little bit more naturally than that. I think this is another one of those cases, and you might have brought it up with the chase itself too, with the uh, Brian Kennedy missing, because he was sort of the car guy. That might also be too where most of these, or all these vehicles are pretty much buggies and there's no or very little identical vehicles you can identify from the old world. And sort of here too with this stunt. I find it funny that Max would have survived this if he stayed in his car, although we don't know if he's got safety belts in there, but the way the collision happens, he would have been perfectly fine, much like the stunt driver would have been too. <laughs> I agree. I think if Max had had maybe like a five-point harness, a good seat restraint holding him in place, he probably could have survived it just because all of the impact against Iron Bar's vehicle is focused on the front of that truck and nothing really goes over the hood to pose a threat to anybody in a driver's seat. Yeah, and you can clearly say as a stunt sort of set up, whether they had Iron Bar's vehicle parked there and just hit it with Max's car or they actually had the two, I don't think there would have been a driver in that second car, but there's no windows, there's no panels, there's very little protection for the stuntman driving Max's car. And to have it sort of launch up and sort of drive over the top and take the roof of Iron Bar's car with it, or the top half of the car with it, is probably the safest way you could have done this stunt. It's just unfortunate, <laughs> the little ramp or that uh, isn't really explained. Yeah. Whether they got 
got to a, a, a turn in the road or something where they're no longer on that road. But I look at that ramp and it almost feels like when you're watching a 1970s exploitation movie and a boom mic <laughs> drips down into the shot. It's a little behind the scenes thing that you, you know it's there, but you don't necessarily want to see it. At least in speed, they say it's a off-ramp, there might be an incline there. <laughs> and that's how you get the bus in the air. But. <laughs> right, but we're on a runway, a proper runway. So it should be perfectly level, perfectly even, with no obstacles. Mm -hmm. Unless they have veered off, there is absolutely no reason for this truck to launch into the air. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing about this is that the air truck is able to take off. You've got Rod Venables visible through the window there as they take off. They've got that awful, I don't know if it's a mannequin or if it's small enough to be considered a doll, but there is something sticking out the top of the plane to represent Mr. Skyfish, and it looks ridiculous because it's just barely clinging on. <laughs> okay, so that's supposed to be Mr. Skyfish? Yeah. Okay, because I was really wondering about that. Like, yeah. I, wh why? Well, he's obsessed with flight. He wants to be a bird. That's why he wears wings. Yes. So, of course, he'd stick out the top, but this poor little mannequin, its hands are up in the air, and it's bent all the way back as if it's lying on its back, and you can actually see Rod's microphone, communication microphone, in front of his face <laughs> as he flies by the camera. Yeah, and back back to that earlier shot too where we're behind the plane and Max pulls in front, you can see the, the kid hanging out the top hatch there as well. I haven't mentioned Cinema Sins in the longest time because I've been ignoring them, but they call out the movie here for the idea that Jedediah said there's not enough runway and yet the plane takes off before it gets to the point where Max collides with Iron Bar mm -hmm. and they are able to get out of the way. And they see that as something bad a plot hole or some sort of shortcoming in this scene. And I have a couple of points in defense of Beyond Thunderdome, and you could take one, leave the other, that sort of thing. So point the first, Max is driving his wagon into Iron Bar, and that action stops the fleet dead. So they're traveling towards the plane at a certain speed. The plane is traveling towards them at a certain speed. And if Max didn't stop the fleet, they would continue at that speed and intercept the plane at a different point than if Max stops them at a certain point and then the plane is able to take off. My second point is that Jedediah was probably exaggerating the amount of runway that he needed because the things that he's wearing on his face are not binoculars. They are reading magnifiers. <laughs> So if you're trying to judge distance, those are not the things you want to use. So Max is sitting there looking at how far out they are, looking at how fast they're going, and he says, oh no, there's enough room if I stop them at this certain point. And Jedediah is like, well, it doesn't look like enough to me. And it's like, well, listen, you bad John Wayne impersonator. That's not how this is going to work. You need to trust me. <laughs> yeah, I'll buy those. Jedediah, he's an interesting character because he's not really wrapped up in all of this. Oh, no, he's he's got very few stakes in this. Yeah. If they all arrive on the scene where he stopped the plane, he's probably the one that's going to get away and survive the situation. Yeah. All he has to do is give the rest of them over and he's scot-free. I think his life would be forever changed. There's no way things are going to go back to the way they were, but he would still be a free man. Yeah. Probably, probably left with his possessions. No guarantees about that. But these people just intruded upon his life that was working out pretty well for him and completely uproot him. And now by the end of this minute, he has taken off, and he's never going home again. Yeah. It's really insane when you think about it. Yeah. He hasn't even had time to pack. <laughs> I really kind of feel for him. So as you mentioned, Jedediah is able to fly away above all this, and we get this lovely shot of Jedediah and Jedediah Jr. inside the cockpit. And Brad, you were kind enough to share your notes with me before the beginning of this recording, but there's something strange going on in this shot inside the cockpit. Yeah, it seems there's a... There's a shape or a shadow that moves past them twice. It's it's almost like someone's outside of the the actual prop or the the set and walking across the light source, which I found weird because they're out in the desert. <laughs> Are these shadows supposed to be the wings? As they're making this banked turn, are the wings casting a shadow on the cockpit? Is that what we think it is? I don't know. I'm looking at the shot of the takeoff and the sky and where the sun is. Well, the sun is 
pretty low. Like in the shot where the buggy and the truck have just hit and the truck is launched into the air, the truck flies up into the air between us and the sun. So the sun does seem pretty low in the sky. So it might be able to create that type of shadow. Yeah, but you can't really trust the position of the sun when you're dealing with George Miller. Mm Because he'll shoot at any time of day. Yeah. He doesn't care. He doesn't really care. (laughs) Yep. Down below, we can see that all of the vehicles are in complete disarray. I don't know why they've piled up quite like this, because in theory, they should have just driven past. Yeah, it's odd that you might say, just getting back to that cinema scenes quickly... By Max getting in front of the aeroplane, it speared iron bar forward, which would have reduced the takeoff area as well, but also it could have been holding the plane back from takeoff speed. But here, as soon as this incident's happened, all of a sudden there's buggies flipping everywhere, there's just a big cloud of dust as vehicles crash, and it moving forward to the end of the film, sort of, we only see three vehicles leave this area <laughs> as Auntie drives off. Yeah. There's a lot of carnage here that isn't really explained. I think the explanation here is that methane is such a precious commodity to them that they don't spend a lot of time teaching the guards how to do high-speed maneuvering. Like, they'll send the guards out for slow patrols around the area, (laughs) but they're not sending them out, okay, we're going to do high-speed maneuvers, this is how you avoid crashes, let's practice your swerving. I think they see a crash happen, and they all flip out. Literally. (laughs) (laughs) That seems very plausible, that they wouldn't get the training that they really need because it consumes resources. Mm. And it comes back to the fact that they're sort of just cobbled together buggies. If they're at full speed barreling down on this plane that's coming at them trying to keep up with Iron Bar, the small trying to swerve or anything in the sand or the dirt just could be enough for things to break. Yeah, they don't have the vehicle stability systems that modern vehicles have. They'd probably get rattled apart just by going too fast. Do you think the drivers, Auntie's guard, have any personal responsibility or personal pride in their vehicles? Do you think they have anything to do with their vehicles at all in building them or maintaining them? My vote's for a no. Yeah, it's true. I would only say with the cow, the cowboy one, because it's the only one that sort of has some sort of identity or uniqueness to it. The cow guy was probably one of those enterprising barter town citizens that heard Auntie say, find the little man, yeah. bring him back, you'll get rewarded type of thing. Yep. And all of the rest of these cars, all of these guards involved in the chase, they're more, they're out of duty. We get one final shot of the passengers in the plane for this minute. They're looking down over all of the nonsense, Savannah Master and Pig Killer and the rest. And the last thing we see this minute is Max, and he's lying face down in the dirt, but he's starting to stir. He's moving his hand. He's still alive. So we're not quite done with him yet. I just love how the kids, they've never been airborne before, yet they're sitting in this open cargo bay door, just looking down at the the carnage below. And Jebediah is here doing these banking turns (laughs) so he can look out his window down there. (laughs) Gravity. Gravity's a (laughs) half-mistress. Yeah, let's hope they are holding on tightly to the door there, because they'd hate for one of them to fall out at this point. (laughs) Well, like the guard waking up, that could have been another little bit to add to the tension as well, Mm -hmm. of someone slipping. Here at the end of the minute, Brad, is there anywhere that you would like to point people to in order for them to find more of your stuff on the internet? I just love this minute-by-minute format, looking at all these little details here, and I started my own for uh, The Lost World Jurassic Park just over a year ago, and we've got... Oh, as of today, uh, two episodes left in that, so that's run and done, and it's good. That's over at thelostworldminute.com. You want to go check that out, and yeah, looking forward to the next project. Sounds good. As for us, we will be back on Wednesday. We get to see Max watch the plane fly away, so we have a little bit of closure there. Speaking of closure, we get to see what's left of Iron Bar. He has one final parting gesture for us to remember him by. <laughs> And Auntie will find Max in amongst the commotion, and we'll get the first half of that iconic ending line. We'll have to split that between Wednesday and Friday, but all that's coming up, so make sure you're there for it. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. 
Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. And our outro music is We Don't Need Another Hero by MilitiaVox of MilitiaVox.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can check out our Tee Public storefront by clicking the store link join our Patreon by clicking the support link, or make a one-time donation by clicking the donate link. Thank you for joining us for Minute 97 of Beyond Thunderdome. We'll see you next time. Everybody!